So, uh, it's the end of the day. I was feeling a bit tired. How's the energy level in the room? Are you guys okay? Tired? Kind of in the middle. Do you want to, for those of you who didn't just walk in, do you guys want to stand up for a second and stretch? Because I find that it keeps me awake. If you're good, if you're good. I just want to give you the opportunity. Okay. Um, so, uh, oh, you have a question? Can we dim the lights? <laughs> is that dim or is that extinguished? <laughs> is that better? Yes. Okay. So, uh, yeah, my name's Gabe. Uh, I work here at NEO. We're one of the platinum sponsors of this conference. We do some Python work, but we're not strictly a Python shop. I get to help all kinds of companies solve all kinds of problems as a software engineering consultant. And it's a great place to work, so I just wanted to give a quick shout out and thank you uh, to Neil for letting me come here today to speak to you guys also. Um, I've been writing software professionally for about 12 years, longer but, uh, than that, but I didn't get paid for all that time. Uh, but uh, I haven't been writing Python that long. I've only been using Python for about nine months. So some of the stuff that I'm going to say today, if I say anything that's wrong, let me know, because uh, I want to learn from that too. Uh, but I love learning, and I love sharing what I've learned. So uh, recently on a project, uh, we did a lot of Python testing, and I felt like the built-in unit test uh, tools that Python offers were fine, but uh, I have a lot of experience in Ruby, and Ruby has great testing culture, and I thought, Python's got to have something better. It turns out, I think that Python does have something better. It's called PyTest, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. PyTest's website says, PyTest helps you write better programs. Now, I think this is true, uh, mostly because I think testing in general helps you write better programs. But PyTest has a lot to love, and that's what I'm going to try and communicate to you today. But before we get going, can I just get a show of hands? How many of you uh, are familiar with unit testing, are comfortable writing unit tests? Hands up. Okay, about half. Uh, so I'm going to try and keep this talk mostly jargon free. Uh, so in a minute, I'll make sure that I introduce exactly what I mean when I talk about unit testing. And, and hopefully, everybody will make sense. This is also, there's a lot of code in this talk, so if I go too quickly, just put your hand up and tell me to slow down, because we've got time. And I want you to understand that. So, PyTest is popular. Uh, PyPy is an alternative implementation of Python. Uh, the maintainer of PyTest is also the maintainer of PyPy. Now, PyPy has, as you can see, uh, over 21,000 tests written, so that's pretty cool, and it should have a lot of tests written, because it's a you know, if, it, if that doesn't work, the stuff you write and then run on it isn't going to work either. Uh, Sentry is an exception notification service. Uh, Talks, uh, you heard about in this morning's keynote, uh, it lets you test out your whatever Python project you're writing in a continuous integration environment with all the different Python environments that you want. Uh, Cloudera is a big data company. Uh, they have a few different products. One of them is called Impala. It's a no. It, it's like a SQL-like uh, query ability on top of the Hadoop ecosystem. Uh, that they use PyTest for testing a lot of Impala. Uh, Spotify, as you heard this morning, also uses PyTest, and a lot more people. So the, the key benefits: it's popular. I've already mentioned that. So it's concise, and I'll show you what I mean when I say PyTest. Uh, tests are concise. Uh, there are helpful assertion messages that let you know when one of your assertions don't pass. Why not? Uh, there's a lot of power in PyTest's fixtures, and I'll talk about what a fixture is and, and what, what it means to PyTest. Uh, and there's a lot of plugins, and so that's kind of what I'm going to cover today. Uh, I'm also going to talk a little bit about mocking and stubbing uh, and a, a library that you can use to do that it plays very nice with PyTest or any testing framework. Some other things about PyTest from PyTest website. Uh, as you can see, it, uh, it runs pretty much everywhere. I think it also probably still runs in Python. That's what the website says. Uh, if you happen to need to run Python and Java together. 
PyTest itself is very well tested with more than a thousand tests against itself. It's, uh, they have a strict backwards compatibility guideline, so your stuff's not going to break if you update PyTest the latest version. Um, yeah, and a lot of people use it. Uh, and uh, oh, that last bullet point is a little bit wrong. It comes with many tested. Uh, that should say uh, it, it comes with a, a lot of examples that, that you can see if you want to know more. Uh, the documentation is fantastic. So enough about that, let's get going. How do you install it? Well, that's really easy. Uh, you just install it with pip, probably. I hope you're using pip. Uh, and you'll notice that it's called pytest without the dot, but the executable that installs when you install pytest is pytest. So that's the command you're going to be running a lot. <coughs> so let's run our first test. But before we do, let's talk about what I mean when I talk about unit testing. So a unit test is kind of the simplest sort of test you can write. The idea is we want to write code that's going to exercise the code that we're writing to make sure it's behaving properly. Uh, it'll make more sense when you see some examples, so I'll get to the examples in a minute. But that's what I mean when I say unit test. On the other end of the spectrum is something we might call an end-to-end -end test or a functional test or an integration test, and that's Kind of like, also you could think of that like black box testing where you're testing your whole system from the outside. Maybe if it's a web app through Selenium or through the web browser and stuff. But unit testing is, I know my code is Python and I'm writing other Python to interact with my classes to make sure they behave properly. So, here's our first test. We're gonna make a function called plus one. Pass it something, it's gonna add one to it. And here's the test. We're gonna test that if we call plus one with number three, we should get five. Now obviously that's a wrong test. I want it to be a wrong test so that we can see an error message that'll happen. Now you'll notice all we need to write here is assert, and then for the for inequality anyway, you just have to say assert something uh, and equals something else in this case. And PyTest will be smart enough to know what the heck you mean. So for most of the time, all you need to remember is assert when you want to test the behavior of something. And so how do we run this? So you can give PyTest a file, and it'll run all the tests that it discovers in that file, and I'll talk more about discoverability later. You can give it a directory, and it'll run all the tests that it sees in that directory. Or from within a directory, you can just run PyTest, and it will do all kinds of magic to try and figure out where all of your tests are uh, in standard places that they might be in the module that you're writing, uh, and it'll run everything it finds. So if we run PyTest on that simple test uh, that we wrote, what happens? That's the default output. Don't bother looking at all that right now. I just want to show you what it looks like. Let's zoom in. This is the important part. So as you can see, uh, PyTest does its best to tell us what went wrong and where. Uh, and the default output is, is quite verbose, but also quite helpful uh, in that you know, it will show you uh, exactly where. It shows you surrounding, uh, surrounding lines to where your assertion failed, which is often very helpful. Uh, if that's too verbose for you, and it usually is for me, uh, you can give PyTest different flags when you run it from the command line that will make it behave differently. Uh, I'm not going to get into that, it doesn't really matter for the scope of this talk, but you can configure that. So test discovery. This is how PyTest is going to figure out where your tests are. Um, the rules are pretty simple. You know, if, it, if the file has test in the beginning of it or in the end of it, it'll look there. Uh, inside those files, if something has a uh, test in the, at the beginning and the end of the function name, uh, it'll run those. Uh, also, it will look for classes that are called test something, and it will run things inside that. Uh, it'll generally pretty much just work, and if you get confused, again, I'm going to say this long as talk, just check the documentation. Uh, it's fantastic, and there's a lot of it. So what are some of the real interesting things you can do with PyTest? How does PyTest try and help you more than, say, the, the default unit test stuff that comes with Python? Well, there's this thing called context-sensitive comparisons, and it, it's exactly what it sounds like. If you compare things in PyTest, it does its best to tell you exactly where it went wrong if the comparison doesn't succeed. So in the case of uh, string differences, it'll show you where in the string it's different. It won't just say, I'm sorry, they're different strings. Because that's not as helpful as saying, yeah, I know they're different strings, and here's exactly what's different about them. Uh, it'll also work for multi-line strings. So in a multi-line string, it'll try and highlight the line that was different. It'll also work uh, for really, really long string diffs. So this is a little bit obtuse, but uh, what I'm making is 
uh, in the variable called a, we're going to do a string that's, what do I do, 100 ones, and then the letter a, and then 100 twos, and then in b, we're going to do 100 ones, and then b, and then 100 twos. So they're really, really, really long strings that are only different right in the middle. And PyTest will say, right, okay, they're different. Here's how many characters I skipped, and then here's the, the, the one that's different. So you know exactly where in your really, really, really long strings are different. And it doesn't flood your terminal with you know, uh, the whole strings, because that would be not as helpful. It's even smarter than that. I can do set diffs. So if I have sets and I want to compare them, it'll tell me, right, this element was on the one on the left and not on the right. Also, the right side had this element that wasn't on the left. Uh, and it'll do that for dictionaries, too. That's really cool. So it can say, right, this key was present on this one and not on that one, or the key was present in both, but the values were different, etc. So that's the simple kind of equality assertions you can do in PyTest. And there's a lot more things you might want to do. One thing that you'll usually need to know how to do is, how do I test if something goes wrong? And what I mean is, there are cases where I want my code to, throw, to raise exception, but I want to test that the code raises the exception and not crash out and stop all my other tests from running. Uh, so PyTest gives you a nice way to do that. You can see here, the syntax is, uh, you just say, with PyTest raises. So it gives you this uh, context manager that you can run your code in, and you're saying there, this is the error I expect it to raise. And so if it does, we're good. So this test will pass. If, it, if that test didn't pass, if I, if I expected it to raise a different error, PyTest would say, hey, you expected this error, but I got this other error. So it, it works exactly as how you might imagine it would. Now, another thing you need to know how to do is uh, like set up and tear down stuff, right? I might have five tests, and each of them, you know, is going to use the same object and, and, and exercise it in different ways. And so instead of creating that object five times in all of my, uh, my tests, I might want to do it just once in a setup method. And then maybe for some reason at the end, I want to tear it down uh, because maybe I'm using a resource, I'm locking something on the system, something in, with the database, whatever. The classic way to do this, and the way you might be familiar with if you're just used to things like a unit test, is what we call X unit setup and tear down. And this is how it works in PyTest. So if you have a method called set a module and tear down module, it will run those at the beginning of whatever test uh, the, you know, these files are, whatever file, I'm sorry, whatever file these methods are found in. So if you write those, it's going to run at the beginning of everything else that finds there and at the end. So let's collapse that down and now let's talk about the next part. Um, if we have a class method uh, called set of class, so we're using a decorator here, it will run that once for every method inside this test class. That should hopefully make sense. So that's the same for the setup and for the tear. So let's collapse that down. Let's put the next part in. Then for every uh, method, we can even surround each of our methods with setup and tear down. So imagine we had set up method and tear down method. And then finally, imagine we have some actual tests. So basically what I'm trying to illustrate here is if we have set up module and we have set up class and we have set up method and we have two test methods inside this test file, what's the output going to look like? And look like that. Hopefully that makes sense. But I don't want you to use this technique in the tests you write. I want you to use PyTest's fixtures feature. This is one of the greatest things about PyTest. And when I first started using PyTest, I was like, eh, this doesn't seem so great. I want, I, I understand this, this classic X unit setup stuff. Let me just use that. But I'm a total convert now, and you should be too. And if this feels a little uncomfortable at first, that's fine, but it's better. Just trust me uh, and, and give it a chance. So what are fixtures? Uh, there's like the general term for fixtures, and then there's the PyTest term. This is what fixtures mean in PyTest world, right? Fixtures, as it says, uh, they want to give you a fixed baseline for, that your test can depend on. And in PyTest, they've got explicit names, and you activate them by declaring their use in the test function. And what PyTest will do is it's going to use, basically, it's very simple. It's dependency injection, and that's jargon. But all dependency injection means is, if I write a test method and I say, this test depends on something called person, and I have a fixture called person, 
PyTest will make sure it gives me a person and puts it into my test for me. So that's what the, the test runner is going to do. So PyTest is inspecting you know, my test methods and doing smart things first to figure out what they depend on and making sure it can provide them for it. So here's an example. We've got a person, We've got a method called greet. We're going to make a fixture called person. It could be called anything, but I decided to call it person. Uh, and it's just going to return me an instance of my person class. And then I'm going to use that person fixture in this test called greet, right? So I'm going to get the greeting value out of calling greet on my person instance, and I'm going to check. Now, this test should fail because my person returns hello there, and I'm expecting it to be hi there. That's intentional. I want to show what a failure looks like. But that's how we use a fixture. The thing to note here is a fixture is just a function that you use this PyTest fixture decorator on. So what's happening here? Right, PyTest is going to see that we've got uh, test greet that needs uh, a person. It's going to go, right, I see that there's a fixture called person. I'm going to run that fixture. I'm going to get the result of that fixture, and I'm going to pass that into my test greet function. And then test greet can just run. So let's look at that again. Now that you understand, hopefully, what fixtures do and how they work. Does that make sense? How we're just making a, a method and we're PyTest figures out that because we said we needed something called person, there was a fixture called person injects in it. It's not really that magical, but it's really handy. So that's what the output of the test would be like, right? It's exactly what you expect. Hopefully that there should be no surprises here. It's just that we use PyTest to set up that person for us. So what I like about fixtures is your whole world for what you need to be concerned with for thinking about is this test correct is right there in your test method definition. Fixtures are awesome for more reasons than I have time to explain. Here are some of the points about it. Fixtures can call other fixtures. So just like your test method can say, I'm, I'm dependent on this fixture, your fixture can say, I'm dependent on this other fixture. Uh, and that can be very convenient for reducing the duplication in all of your test setup code. You can also parameterize a test function against a fixture. Uh, I don't want to get into too much of the details about that, but I'll show you an example of par parameterization later. And if we have time, I have a bonus tip involving that. Uh, you can share your fixtures. So normally you de declare your fixtures just in whatever test file you're using them. But suppose you have something that's so common in your all of the tests you want to write, uh, you can put it in this file called conftest.py. That's a special file that PyTest will look for, and it will make sure all those fixtures are loaded and available for everything. You could also, of course, just put them in a module and manually import that module, right? Because it's just Python. It's just Python code. Um, you can also tell a uh, fixture auto use equals true, and that will say you don't have to say hey, this test function depends on this fixture. So be careful with that because what I just said about if I look at my fix if my test function, I know everything I need to know about the context. That's not true once you start using auto use true. But there are cases where all the dang tests in my file, or maybe all except one, really need this thing. So why don't I just say auto use true? So it's there if you want it. Uh, and of course, you can test your fixtures if you want to, because they're just functions. So you can even write tests against your fixtures, and that can be helpful at sometimes. I don't say you shouldn't start doing that because, like, then where does the, just like where does the cycle end? But at some point, you may end up with a fixture that's non-trivial, that's not one line instance like I had before. And at that point, you might say, I want to clean this fixture up. I want to refactor it. You can run a quick test against that fixture first to, to make sure that you know the behavior it's supposed to be exhibiting, and then refactor, and hopefully your test will be passing, or it'll tell you why not. And you don't have to deal with you know, 50 broken other tests in the meantime. OK, so that's fixtures in a nutshell. Now let's talk about verifying calls. And so here we're going to switch context a little bit. I want to talk about stubbing, mocking and stubbing. So verifying calls. What, what I mean here is there are times when, in our unit testing, we don't just want to look at the return value of some function that we're calling. Right? We also might want to test the collaborations between objects. And that's where uh, you want to, you need to test that somehow. 
I'm going to recommend a library called Mock. Now this is built into Python 3. If you're using Python 2, you can still get it with Mock. You just need to pip install Mock. So here's an example. Let's start with a simple database. This is a very contrived example, but it should illustrate the point. Pretend we have some database class, and the interesting thing is we have some method here called persist. And persist expects a person to be passed to it, and it does something, right? It's going to take that person object, and it's going to serialize it and write it somewhere. Who cares what? The point is, that's, we need to make sure that it's persisting people. Now, imagine we have a person class, uh, and we initialize it with a name and a reference to our database. And we have a method called save. So if I have an instance of a person, and I say save on that person, maybe after updating their name, the person class is responsible for persisting itself to the database. Right? It should say, with my reference to the database, I'm going to say, hey, persist me. Does that make sense? OK. What we want to test is, when I call save on person, does it interact with the database the right way? That's how I'll know my code is, right? this is like effectively it's a side effect that I want to test. I need to make sure that my person class is collaborating with the database class that I've given it. So here's how we do it. We're going to import mock from the mock library. And uh, so in my test, for example, I had you know, mock example was where our actual classes were, so we're going to import them here. And here, we're going to say, I have a fixture called mockdb. And what I'm going to return from that fixture is an instance of a mock. And I'm going to tell it this spec db part says raise an, an exception if I'm accessing an attribute on this thing that doesn't belong to the thing you've spec'd. So if I, if I looked at this database, this is a pretend database, right? It's not actually a D, an instance of db now. But if I call deep my, you know, db, or if I called foo on this mock object, it would say, hey, foo, I don't have that. You're interacting with me in a way that you don't expect. And that's just to pre prevent yourself from thinking that something works one way when it works a different way. It's a good idea to use specking. You don't have to, but I recommend it. Now, the testing world calls these things different things, so I want to just like dispel jargon for a minute. I don't care what you call it, I just want to tell you what mock calls it. So, in general, we might call this, this thing that we need, we might call it a test double. That's probably the most generic way to, and I don't mean double like a number, I mean double like a stump double, right? This is a thing that's going to stand in place of some other thing. And all a mock, an instance of mock is, from the mock library is, it's an object that will keep track of how do I interact with it. It'll remember the calls that I call on and the arguments that I call to it. And it will let me interrogate it later to say, were you called this way? And it's like, yeah, I was, or no, I wasn't. And so it lets us put it in place of a real instance of this thing because I don't, I don't need a real instance of my database here. In fact, most of the time in your unit testing, you don't want a real instance of something like a database. But, you know, or something that's going to have side effects that you don't care about. I'm trying to isolate the unit under test. And in this case, I don't care about a database. I just care that my person class interacts with a database the, the appropriate way. So I'm going to make a fixture called mockdb that's returning me a mock. It's, just, it's a mock that will alert me if I interact with it in a way that's different than what a DB knows how to do. Now let's write our test. So I'm going to write a test, and you can see the test depends on that mockdb fixture. And what I'm going to say here is I'm going to make a person, and I'm going to call save on that person. And then here's the interesting part. We're going to say mockdb, did somebody call persist on you? Right? So mocks have this method called assert called with, and you can pass the arguments to them, and it will say, yep, I was called that way, no problem. Or in, in which case, you know, your test passes. Or it will say, whoa, I was not called that way. I won't pass. So this test will pass. Is this making sense? Marks are weird if you're not used to them. But once you think about the fact that I don't need this to be a real DB. I just need it to tell me if I'm interacting with this the right way. That's all I really care about here. It makes more sense. Okay, so let's look at how they fail. So in this case, 
if we, uh, if we make a new test that gets MockDB passed in, right, this is a new instance of MockDB. I should have mentioned that before, maybe. PyTest gives you a new instance of that, of that fixture. It runs that fixture once every time for every test, right? It's a clean world. There's no side effects between each of your test methods. So here we have a new MockDB instance passed into this test, and I'm not doing anything with it. I'm just gonna straight up make an assertion call on it, which obviously will fail because nobody's interacting with it. So here I'll just say assert call with nothing, just like, I don't even care, right? A, new, a different way to write that would have just been like assert call, but I don't know if that exists in mock, so I'm just gonna say assert call with and not pass any arguments. And what'll happen here uh, is uh, it will say, I expect it persists to be called, but I wasn't. So that's a helpful failure that tells me, right, obviously I must be doing something wrong. Um, what happens if we call it, but not the way we expect? So in this case, I'm gonna call persist with one, two, three, uh, but I'm gonna say, just assert I was called with nothing. Uh, and here it's gonna say, ah, yeah, um, you told me you expected to be called with nothing, but I was actually called with one, two, three. So again, a helpful failure. What if I call it multiple times? So I'll call persist with one, and then I'll call persist with two. What if I then want to make a, an assertion about, did, you know, did, I, did I call it with one ever? So now I need to use this thing called assert any call, because it turns out, and I'll get to that in a second, uh, assert called with should actually probably be renamed something like assert last called with, or, or assert most recently called with, because it actually only looks at the most recent call by default. But they, Mocks remember all your calls. So if you don't care what order they happen in, you can just say assert any call. If you care exactly what order it, the calls happen in, you can actually just say, uh, you can look at the calls. So I can say from you know, mockdb.calls, and it will give me back a list of all of the calls uh, in order with all of their arguments, and I can dig down into that and do whatever assertions I want. So that's the gotcha. Assert called with only tracks the last call. It only tells me about the last call. Um, the other thing to remember is, if you call mock bar, let's say, uh, you know, uh, and then uh, I try to assert, was it uh, called with foo ever? It's going to tell me no, I was never called with foo, so it'll fail. But what it won't tell me is, I was called with bar, right? Because often what happens is you'll have a typo somewhere, and your test is going to fail, and you're going to think, oh, damn, I'm not calling it, but I was calling it. I just passed in the wrong thing, right? You know, my expectation is wrong, but I don't know it. So beware of that as a gotcha. In my infinite free time, which I haven't managed to find yet, I want to make a patch that will tell, you know, I want to submit a patch to mock that will say, that will fix this behavior, that will say, hey, you asked for any, any call. This one wasn't there, but this one was. Because that's a, that's a helpful failure message that I think could be improved on. Okay, now let's talk about stubbing return values. So here, all I mean is, sometimes I don't want to just check how am I interacting. I also want to check, uh, I, want to, I want to replace the behavior. Uh, so how do we do that? So we're switching gears, we're going to pick a different example now. So imagine we have a weather service. And imagine this weather service just has uh, one method uh, called barometer. And uh, whenever I call a barometer, it's going to, imagine this was actually doing a barometer reading and, and telling me if the barometer was rising or falling. Uh, in this case, so the point is it's non-deterministic behavior. This is gonna be hard to test, because right? what I wanna do is start writing tests against this. Uh, so imagine we have a forecaster, and imagine this forecaster, we give it the weather service, and we say to the forecaster, please forecast. And what forecast does is it goes out to the weather service and says, what's the barometer reading right now? And once it knows the barometer reading, it says, okay, if the barometer is rising, the pressure is coming in, it's going to rain. And if the barometer is falling, then the pressure is going away, it's probably not going to rain. Does that make sense? Now, how do I test this? I can't test this with just normal expectations because I have non-deterministic code. So what I really want to do is I want to give a mock somewhere in here, but I want to dictate how that mock's going to behave, right? I want a mock weather service that I can say the, when, when barometer gets called, return rising, and then check that forecast forecast appropriately, and vice versa for falling. So let's do that. So, uh, we'll make a fixture called mock WS. Uh, I'm only, I don't think that's a good name, by the way. I'm only saying mock WS in the interest of saving space on the screen. 
so this is going to return a mock uh, that is spec like weather service. And here we'll run a test that says, right, okay, when the barometer is rising, uh, do I get rain, right? Does my forecaster forecast rain when the weather service that it's instantiated with uh, returns rising for the barometer method? Okay? So the way we do that is with return value. It's kind of an unsurprising name for it. So just like you can do a cert called with on a mock, you can also assign onto the return value attribute whatever you want that mock to return. Then the mock will still keep track of how it was called. That doesn't change. But it will also now give a return value back to anybody who calls it that way. And that lets me test this non-deterministic behavior. There are other cases where it's not something that's non-deterministic that you want to stub out, but uh, maybe an expensive operation, like a write to the database or a write to the file system even. Instead of that, I can just say, right, uh, object dot save, return true, right? Because I have some other collaborator that says, save this thing and, and, and wait for it to return true, and then that assumes that it was saved successfully, however it was. So this is a very valuable technique, and you should be comfortable with it. Similarly, the test for the other case, this best should be no surprise. It's exactly the same thing, we're just testing the other case. Now, the astute readers in the audience will say, Gabe, there's a lot of duplication between these two tests. And I agree. So, I told you before that the PyTest has this cool feature called parameterized tests. And this is a perfect case of when you want to use it. So obviously you can spot that duplication, right? Forecaster is exactly the same. Uh, and the next line where we make the mock, uh, where you stub a return value in, that differs and so does the forecast value, but that's it. So, we can refactor like this. It's the feature in PyTest. So, you say with this decorator called uh, mark parameterize, you give it uh, two, in this case I'm saying, here are two um, variables that I want the test to be able to see, and then here are the values I want for each of those conditions. So, for example, expected, uh, I'm sorry, the, what's the barometer reading, and then what's the expected forecast. So those are the labels for my values, and then I have two uh, two lists, right? I'm sorry, I have two tuples. I have a list of two tuples. And then the test will run once with each of those tuples injected into the appropriate name dependencies from the test. That's pretty cool. That's a really helpful feature. I'll show you another one if we have time. That's a little bit different, even more powerful. And now let's talk about monkey patching. Uh, monkey patching sounds like something you shouldn't do uh, but there are cases when you need to. So, this is the same as before. Let's take our weather service example. That code hasn't changed. But now, what if one of you in the audience is saying, okay, what if I can't inject a mock into my constructor? Right? What if the code I'm working with, which I don't have control over, what if when I instantiate a forecaster, it doesn't let me provide a weather service? What if weather service is some other module, right? And what if forecaster imports that module and then instantiates a weather service from that module? I can't inject it anymore, so how can I pass in a mock? How can I change its behavior? I still want to. Well, you can, and PyTest has a feature called monkey patching for this. Now, I'll also mention that mock also has a similar feature in it called patch. I prefer using the monkey patching feature from PyTest because mock patch works uh, with a, as a context manager. And that's a great way to do it. The context managers make sense because it's easy to understand that, right, everything inside the context manager is going to have something wrapped with and at the end of it it's probably going to get unwrapped. But I just don't like having nested levels of uh, indentation if I don't need to. And so sometimes you might want to patch two different things and so I'll say, with this thing patched that way and also this other thing patched that way, now I've got you know, two indents more than I really need and all the rest of my Dane code is inside that and I, don't, I think that looks weird. So, I prefer PyTest's monkey patch, but it's the same concept. Let me explain how it works. So it's a special predefined fixture, so you're, we're gonna depend on it inside all of our test methods that need to monkey patch. And all you do is you say monkey patch .set adder, and you give it the name, uh, you give it the path of what you want to monkey patch, and you give a value back for it. And PyTest will patch it only for the duration of that 
test, and then it will unpatch it again for the other. So, so there, again, there's not going to be any contamination between tests here. So let me explain exactly what that looks like. So here, we're going to rain when the barometer is rising. So this is a similar test as before, except now we can't control, we can't inject our weather service in. So instead, we'll use monkey patch. Now, there are some tricky things going on here that's a little bit different than the last time you saw me using mock. Okay. We need to mock the weather service constructor, right? Because what does our forecaster do? He says, from weather service, import weather service, capital W, capital S, uh, and then it instantiates one of those things. So what I need to do is say, when my forecaster instantiates a weather service, I want it to give me back a mock so I can, I can put a stub value on that. So that's what I have to do here. If that makes sense, we're gonna say, uh, WS and capitals. I usually use capitals here to remind me that this is a, a mock behaving like a class constructor and not an instance. So WS, capital WS, is going to be a mock where the return value of the mock, so this is another new syntax, you can specify the return value in the mock constructor. So when somebody calls WS, they get back the mock web uh, weather service that my, th that fixture that existed before. And so then we can say, Okay, PyTest, please monkey patch forecaster.weatherService to be this mock constructor. So the thing is, you just patch where it's used. Uh, and this works, I get because you know, Python modules are singletons, right? They're like cheap singletons. And so it's already been loaded. It can go in there and it can mutate it, and the dependent code will see the updated version of it, the, the stubbed, patched version, and use that. So this is how you can do that. Does that make sense to people? It's a little bit weird, but after you write it once, it's okay. So, that's the end of the mocking and stubbing section. PyTest is also awesome, as I said before, because of its plugins. I'm gonna talk about all their plugins. No, I'm not. It's a lot of plugins. Uh, I'm gonna talk about one of them, because I don't have time to talk about a lot of them. Uh, I'm also going to talk about this plugin in relation to some other features of PyTest you don't know about yet. So, a cool feature that you often want is I run a test and uh, I get in a, a failure, right? I, I'm expecting food to equal bar and, and it blows up. So, if I do dash dash pdb when I run my PyTest command, PyTest will, when the, when the assertion failure happens, it will inject a debugger just before that assertion. So I can inspect the state of everything that I was about to test. Because maybe I said, you know, foo equals bar, but I meant to say foo equals foo, but I didn't realize that. So drop me into a debugger, let me inspect the system right then and figure out, uh, you know, what's what. The alternative to this, of course, is you could just go into your code, into your test, and say, you know, uh, uh, PDB set trace, right? But I don't like PDB, it's fine. I, I'm an IPython guy. I think a lot of you probably like IPython too. And so you might prefer IPDB, right? Same thing, but it's better. Uh, so there's a plugin called IPDB. Works exactly the same way. But the other thing I want to mention before I talk about how plugins get detected, another PyTest feature is you can say dash X. And dash X says, PyTest, please stop after the first failure. That's really useful in conjunction with dash dash PDB or dash dash IPDB because you say, I want to debug this first error that I had, this first failure, but then once I finish that, I don't want to break on the next one too. If I have 10 failing tests, I don't want to have to say, right, continue, 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 continue 10 times. So combine it with dash X and it will break on the first one and then it'll stop running. The way you install plugins in, Py in PyTest is you just install them into your environment. You, PyTest will detect them. You don't have to do anything magic. So this particular uh, IPDB plugin lives on GitHub. So I have to pip install it from GitHub. But there, most of the PyTest plugins just live on pip, uh, and you can just pip install them. So if you install it, PyTest will detect it. You don't have to do anything. So it'll look inside the current environment for anything that looks like a PyTest plugin, and it will make it available. Five minutes? Cool. OK. Um, I think that means we have time for one more tip. This is perfect. We're right on schedule. Um, here's the tip. 
This is an even wackier version of parameterization. There are times when we may need to change the value of a fixture that's dependent on another fixture. So to get there, let me just build this up. Let's say we have a developer, and developers get initialized with some favorite language. Uh, and then we, we have a method called brag. And brag will just say, right, like, blah, whatever, whatever I love, it's the best. So that's our developer. Now let's make a fixture called language that returns Python. Let's assume that most of the tests we're writing, I'm happy with the language being Python. And we'll make uh, another fixture called developer that depends on language, right? That's just going to initialize a developer that loves Python. And for most of my tests, they're just going to depend on developer, and they're going to make sure, you know, they're going to test it some way and expect it to, when he brags, he's going to brag about Python. That should be no surprise. That's just the, the expected case. But what if we want to make a different developer instance and a different test love Ruby or something else? There's not an easy way to do it if you don't know about this feature. In fact, I don't think you can do it if you don't know about this feature. But there are cases where most of my tests want to use a fixture a certain way, but then I might have one or two off, right? A different condition that's really changing the top level dependency of one of my fixtures, or a higher level dependency of one of my fixtures than what the fixture is. So you can actually parameterize the dependent fixtures. So remember, developer dependent on language. So here, I'm going to parameterize, which you've seen the syntax before, but here, I'm parameterizing a fixture that already exists. And I'm saying instead, when, the, when PyTest goes to resolve developer, it's going to say, oh, developer depends on language. It's going to instead resolve language to be the, the value of Ruby. Now, why is it in, a, in an array there? Or sorry, in a list. It's in a list because just like the other example, right, there's no difference in the syntax. It's doing the same thing. When you parameterize a test, you can give it multiple values and it will test it will run that test with each of the values that you're parameterizing. So in this case, even though I, I'm only doing one, I have to wrap it in a list. It's just a list of one item. But what this is letting me do is uh, in, uh, change the language that the developer feature depends on just for this one test. That's really handy. I didn't know this for like six months of me working with PyTest, and then I kept banging my head against the wall going, this just feels wrong, there's gotta be some way. And then it dawned on me one day when I was rereading the docs, yeah. Why can't I just parameterize a fixture the same way I can parameterize, uh, sorry, a dependent fixture? I, the docs are very clear that you can parameterize uh, values that you want to inject into your test, but it turns out you can also parameterize the values of the dependent fixtures. So that's just good to know. So again, that's just reviewing what the fixtures were. So you, after looking at the previous code, that's, that's why we could do that, right? Because we're saying, uh, the language is a fixture I want to make return Ruby, and that works because developer depends on language. So, that's all for today. If you want to read more, again, the docs are great on both accounts. Both PyTest and Mock have excellent docs. I suggest you take half an hour and just skim them, right? It's going to take you a lot longer to read it all but you don't need to read it all. You just need to be familiar with what concepts are there so that when you're banging your head against a, a, a test and you say, there's gotta be a way to test this better, you'll, you'll pack your brain is gonna say, wait a minute, I thought I remembered seeing something about that in the docs. So just, just skim them so you know what's there. It, it will pay off in droves. Now, uh, maybe we, do we have time for a question? No time for any questions, so that I've used my five minutes. If you have any questions, I love talking about this stuff, obviously, because we've run out of time. Come grab me whenever, and I'm happy to talk. Thank you.